Gauss's law. We are going to start with a positive charge. There it is. What we're going to do is we're going to go through and prove Gauss's law. In order to, eh, let's we'll start with this. We, think, we know the electric field around a charged particle looks like this. In order to do Gauss's law, or improve Gauss's law, we have to draw a Gaussian surface. Gaussian surfaces are so often neglected and forgotten by my students that I have a special marker for them. <laughs> There's a red marker. Whenever I draw a Gaussian surface on the board, I'm going to use a red marker. This is to remind you that you always, whenever you're using Gauss's law, have to draw a red marker. Or have to draw a <laughs> You have to draw a Gaussian surface. So this is our Gaussian surface. Now, it looks like a circle to you, but it is a sphere. Because remember, this is a three-dimensional item that you're looking at here. The electric field is in three dimensions, the Gaussian sphere. So this is a Gaussian surface. In this particular case, it is a sphere. Okay. When we look at this, we can see that at this particular point, the electric field is to the right. At this point, it's up. At this point, it's down. Please point in the direction <coughs> of the area vector of the Gaussian surface at that point, class. The direction of the area vector right here. It's to your right. The area vector right here. Area vector right here. Area vector right here. Okay. Notice it's always in the exact same direction as the electric field. So this is the direction of our area vector <coughs> dA. Because we're going to break it up into a whole bunch of infinitesimally small pieces dA. This is, you'll notice, a non-constant electric field. Before we were talking about electric flux, it had to do with constant electric fields. Here, we're going to be dealing with the electric flux for non-constant electric fields. If you're going to whisper something, I would prefer that you tell me what it is, because I, I get so irked by whispers. I was actually talking about the Thank you. <laughs> Very kind of you. So, the electric flux is equal to the closed surface integral of E dot dA. Ah. That's right. It's called a closed surface integral. We are taking the integral over a surface, and it is a closed surface. Don't freak out. It's OK. When it comes down to using this integral, we only do it in very basic terms. And what we're going to go through today is to make sure you understand how to take the surface the closed surface integral with respect to dA. Okay, so when we look at this, we have dA. We've already talked about the direction of dA. We've already said it's in the same direction as the electric field. So this is equal to the closed surface integral of E dA times a cosine of theta. We know the angle between E and dA. We've shown it. Class, what is it? Class. Zero. It's always in the same direction, so the angle between these two is zero. So we have the closed surface integral of E dot, uh, times dA times a cosine of zero. In other words, this is equal to the closed surface integral of E dA. So basically what we did is we were able to get rid of the dot product, and we know that the cosine of zero is just one. Now, the electric field, moment. Is the cosine always zero for Gaussian surfaces? Let me finish, and I will answer that question. Give me just a minute. So the electric field. Notice that the electric field, because we picked a Gaussian surface, which is a sphere, we know that that electric field is constant no matter which dA we pick. So we can take the electric field out from the closed surface integral. So it's E times the closed surface integral of dA. And class, what is the integral, the closed surface integral of dA? A. Okay. 
Now, to answer your question, Mohit, every time we use Gauss's law, it's going to look like this. It's always going to be a cosine of zero. The electric field is always going to be constant. What happens is we have to pick the shape of our Gaussian <coughs> surface such that this happens every time. So we're never going to deal with anything other than this. Actually, we'll sometimes have a cosine of 90 degrees, which is just zero, and we'll talk about that when it does occur. But uh, every once in a while, well, actually, we'll have that quite often. But it'll either be 90 or zero. It won't be something in between. Wait. Yes? It says non-constant E fields. Is it constant? Ah, it's constant along the Gaussian surface, right? But it's not constant as a function of position from here. OK, so now we have that the electric flux is equal to E times A. We know the electric field around a point particle. It is equal to what, Travis? Say again. The electric field around a point particle. That's what we have right here. Um, KQ over R squared. KQ over R squared. So that's the electric field. We also know the area of a sphere, the surface area of a sphere. It's in our brains. And it is, Jenkins? It's four thirds pi r cubed. It is not four thirds pi r cubed. That would be the volume of a sphere, Emily? Four pi r squared. Four pi r squared. Now, both of these are on your table of information, but again, you're going to use them often enough that it is probably good for you to memorize them. Four pi r squared. So that's the electric field multiplied by the area of the Gaussian surface. So again, notice that this is R, where R is the uh, radius of our Gaussian sphere. So we have then, um, let's see, just to arrange it, oh, R squared cancels out. We get 4 <coughs> pi times K times Q. Well, one thing that you should remember is that from your table of information and from your equation sheet, k is equal to 1 over 4 pi times e naught, where e naught is defined as the permittivity of free space and is just another constant. Therefore, we can replace k with 1 over 4 pi e naught. We get 4 pi times 1 over 4 pi e naught times q. In other words, the electric flux is equal to q divided by not. Or the electric flux, which equals the closed surface integral of E dot dA, is equal to Q divided by E naught. So, specifically, this is the charge inside the closed surface. the closed Gaussian surface. And this is the electric field, the total electric field at the Gaussian surface. Now, this is true for any shape. The truth is, we could have picked a Gaussian surface that was any shape here. Uh, it could have been a cube, could have been any random shape, and it will work out. Uh, mathematically, it gets really complicated to try to do those, so we only prove it using a sphere, but please realize that this is true for any shape Gaussian surface. So notice that the electric flux is going to be equal to, which is equal to Q inside divided by E naught, is going to be equal to zero if there is, if the charge inside the closed, the closed surface is equal to zero, which is exactly what we just went through with the previous problem. In the previous problem, we basically had picked an odd, oddly shaped Gaussian surface, and we proved that the net electric flux going through that Gaussian surface added up to zero, and the reason for that because the charge inside that Gaussian surface was zero. So this is Gauss's law. The total electric flux equals the, the closed surface integral of E dot dA, which is equal to the charge inside the Gaussian surface divided by E naught. Uh, what's E naught? 
E naught is the permittivity of free space. E naught is just a number. It's 8.85 .8 times 10 to the negative, um, negative 11, I think. I don't remember the dimensions on it, but it's it's just a constant, like Boltzmann's constant or whatever they are. Yes, Mike? Wait, so any Gaussian surface doesn't have the charge? No, I'm saying that if a Gaussian surface has no charge inside it, then the net flux going into and out of that uh, Gaussian surface adds up to zero. 